Welcome to Talking Late Night, where we spotlight top comedians and their late night influences. Here's your host, Max Cantor. Hey everybody, and welcome to Talking Late Night. I'm your host, Max Cantor, and today on the show, I have an improviser and a humor writer. Now, he's currently the artistic director of Bats Improv in San Francisco, California, where he's a current player in the company, a teacher, and he's also a corporate trainer. So please welcome to the show, Ken Robertson. Welcome to the show, Ken. Hey, Max. Thank you. I'm thrilled to be here. I'm excited to talk to you, learn all about you know what you do, how you got to where you are today. Uh, and so to get started, uh, growing up, what type of uh, late night television or just comedy influences influenced you and your comedy? I think you know certainly there's all the biggies, and you know caught a little bit of uh, when um, uh, you know the Late Show with Carson was still on and. Uh, Any time they did the uh, Karnak routines, I always loved the Karnak stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, you know, that stuff was kind of de rigueur in my, in my house growing up. Uh, and then, I don't know why it took me so long to discover Letterman, but especially with his sketch, because he did so much more of the, the, the audience pieces and the, the, you know, the desk pieces. And uh, I remember seeing a whole bunch of bits that Chris Elliott used to do and just absolutely loved those. Because uh, Chris Elliott would just pop up with just the weirdest stuff that would just blow my yeah, mind. Right. Um, I remember you know him popping up out of the audience from time to time, and because you know, they had that little trap door out there, and you know he would pop up and come up just covered in coal dust, and this puff of smoke would come up, and he would warn the audience not to go down there because they had a cave in under audience section three, or something <laughs> like that. Uh, and just you know love that bizarre you know just out of left field one quick shot, and then you're kind of left wondering what. Uh, and I always love that feeling. So you so, like, uh, yeah, that was pretty much the late night there. So you enjoyed like the absurdity behind it. Absolutely. I mean, I love the, I always love the craftsmanship of the Johnny Carson jokes. Cause those were always just beautifully crafted and very, very elegant in an, in an older style. I don't really think you see those much anymore. Uh, but the Letterman stuff would just have this complete absurd stuff that was just, it kind of just delighted my brain of like, I had no idea where that was coming from. Um, I'm just, you know, dropping things off the roof that you would <laughs> never think of even putting together. Or, uh, you know, again, I mentioned Chris Elliott. I remember one a little quick bit where they were going to prove which had less cholesterol, corn oil or canola oil. <laughs> and Chris Elliott comes out dressed as a scientist and has this table full of test tubes and Bunsen burners and, you know, two bottles of oil. And he picks one up. And, you know, it looks like he's about to pour it in a test tube and then takes a huge swig out of it directly out of the oil bottle, uh, looks sick, sets it down, looks at the other bottle for a second, kind of like, I don't know that I can do this, but then picks it up and takes another huge swig out of it, sets it down and looks like he's, you know, going to just throw up all over the place uh, and just looks out at the camera and goes, I can't tell a difference. Yeah. Uh, you know, and just that. <laughs> so that whole thing of leading you down one path, then taking this just weird, absurd angle was always just, I, I always loved that stuff. Did you ever try when, uh, when you're, when you were watching it to like replicate that style of humor in your personal life? Like, did it make you want to become a comedian when you saw them doing this? It absolutely did. The, I mean, I had, you know, there were other influences outside of late night, certainly the Monty Python, uh, absurdist style, and, and, which I always loved because, again, it was I, I had no idea that was coming. And I would play with it growing up and, and come up with ideas. And I remember uh, at one point in time I had a book report in, I think it was junior high, uh, on Dante's Inferno, I believe. And a friend and I had this, you know, gave the book report as basically Satan and his minion. And we were kept just bringing in weird things, you know, basically selling hell as a wonderful vacation spot. And uh, I'm sure we thought we were much more funny than we actually were. Uh, <laughs> but trying to bring that in of you know any little place I could. Now, in terms of being a comedian, it's weird because I had seen a lot of that stuff on late night, and uh, certainly have you know when I discovered that wow, there are actually albums of stand-ups who are fantastic. You know, again, the absurdist stuff like Steve Martin. Uh, it was one of those things where I thought these were kind of strange, special, genetically gifted people that somehow had, you know, been hit by lightning and, and, you know, it wasn't something that one could aspire to. It was just these people were just sort of created out of whole cloth, you know, born like Athena, you know, 
Um, so it was one of those that I would play with, but I never even imagined that this was something somebody could do professionally. Mm -hmm. Did you ever, cause it seems like you were, you were very interested in like the sketch aspect of stuff. So do you remember how old you, you were when you first started maybe creating your own comedy material? I was, uh, like the first thing I can really remember was around junior high, maybe the sort of the end of grade school. So, you know, say 12, 13 mm -hmm. around that area. Do you My family had always loved you know, laughing and we always joked around uh, and, you know, we actually moved around quite a bit. So comedy was kind of one of those things that I could escape into that, you know, I had mentioned uh, things like uh, um, uh, Steve Martin and, you know, discovering those stand-up albums because those were, those were my friends. I could listen to those and they kind of made sense out of the world because they looked at the world the way it was and went, eh, things are a little broken. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they were always present. They were always companions. They were always good friends. And uh, so I started thinking about that stuff. And it was more like having conversations with these kind of people and wondering, like, how long could I keep up with them? How long could I have a conversation with them? And that was really how I developed that comedy in my mind. Uh, and then as I went further, there were occasionally there would be opportunities for these things to happen. Because uh, I actually went to my undergrad and graduate studies were both as a professional actor. And uh, that was because I, you know, I love performing and love getting up on stage. But comedy was one of those things that I thought, like I said, it was, ah, that's, these are, you know, these people that were just struck by lightning and somehow, you know, mutants that, you know, became, it came into this performing. Mm -hmm. But when we had these opportunities for comedy, I jumped at them. And I remember in grad school, the, uh, the second year uh, in studying that the students always put on a big Christmas show. And a lot of the people I was working with uh, didn't quite know what to do when we were coming up with these sketches that, quite honestly, were fairly bad. Uh, and I just jumped in and kind of took the reins on that and started writing stuff, and I couldn't stop. Uh, it just had just a fantastic time doing it. So uh, it was one of those that whenever the opportunity came up, I jumped in wholeheartedly and kind of you know <laughs> didn't realize, it's, oh, I've been doing this 24 hours straight. Maybe sleep would be a good idea. <laughs> Right. Do do you recall what the very first sketch you wrote or character you created or bit you invented, anything like that? Uh, the very first. Wow. Uh, you know, honestly, I think you know, I'd mentioned that that book report where we did the, you know, we're playing Satan and his minion. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that was the first one that I really put some time into. Uh, because it was this friend that I had that we were joking around and just kind of playing with this idea. And the minute he mentioned it, I immediately came in and started putting this together. And he ended up playing Satan, and I ended up playing everybody else in hell. <laughs> and so, you know, I would be this demon that would come in and bring him, you know, plates of slime or, uh, you know, remind him that, you know, when he would talk about it, it's eternal torture. And I would come in and poke him and whisper in his ear and say, it's eternally good fun. <laughs> uh, you know, little crazy things like that. Mm hmm when when you went to college, because you said you majored in, in acting, right? Yeah, so, in, the, in classical theater. I, I spent a lot of time and uh, effort and money learning how to, uh, as I say it, uh, bore people in a loud voice. <laughs> so, so when you went there to, to major in, in acting, classical theater, did you do it with the intention that it would lead you to comedy or because you just wanted to be an actor? I just wanted to be an actor. I love again, telling stories. I think that was the, the key. You, you had mentioned before that I was drawn to sketch in particular. Uh, and it was about those stories. And there's an old adage in, uh, in theater. Um, I forget who the, the exact gentleman is. I mean, I, it's probably Urban Lore, uh, who you know, was this famous actor, around, British actor, around the turn of the uh, 19th to 20th century, who was you know, on his bed dying after a long career. And, uh, you know, somebody came in to, you know, was writing his memoirs and asked him and said, you know, sir, after such a wonderful career and after having moved so many people, is it hard facing your own mortality? And the guy sort of opened his eyes and looked up at him and said, my boy, dying is easy. Comedy is hard. <laughs> and that was always so, you know, I kind of, you know, it's like Shakespeare. Sure. No problem. Comedy. Ooh, that's tough stuff. So it was always in the back of my mind, but I really honestly thought it was pretty much unachievable. Mm -hmm. So uh, when those opportunities came up, I jumped at it, but it was kind of like, oh, this is a fleeting bit of fun. 
because uh, I, I really never thought it was something that you could go in and design yourself to be able to do. Mm -hmm. Now, with, with regards, you know, thinking about your classical theater background, do you think mm -hmm. that a lot of uh, prospective playwrights and maybe musical writers, uh, they avoid comedy because, like you said, it is so hard and drama is a bit easier to write because you just write about death or write about more sadness? Do you think a, a lot of people who have comedy potential just avoid it because of its difficulty? I think so. I think there's also, there's a perception of, uh, and, you know, certainly among classical actors uh, and a lot of the directors that I work with, there was a perception that if you could get somebody to, you know, cry, you, know, you get to the end of Romeo and Juliet, you have two kids, you know, committing suicide and dying in this, you know, prologue coming out in a very stentorian voice telling you why it's sad and awful. Uh, and there's a perception of if you can move people to tears, that's true. And to me, it's like, I'm not so sure. Um, you know, honestly, moving people to tears is not that difficult. Just, you know, the Sarah McLaughlin, uh, um, you know, will you please adopt this dog commercial? You know, those are very easy to move people to tears. Uh, and there are, there's enough sadness in the world that, you know, getting that particular emotion, uh, I don't think is incredibly difficult. It can be really cheesy, um, but I think it's easier than comedy. Comedy can illuminate so many other truths than just tears. Uh, and I think that may be why it's a little overwhelming because you're trying to say something without saying it exactly on the nose. Uh, and, you know, drama, you can come in and, you know, say, ah, isn't this sad? And everyone goes, oh, yes, it is. Uh, you know, isn't it sad that Titanic sank and Leo didn't make it off, you know, didn't get the chance to sit on the door? Uh, but comedy, you're trying to point out that there was plenty of room on that door. He could have made it. He just had to wrap this film up. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think that's where it comes in because comedy is less of an, I hate to say an exact science because I don't really drama is an exact science, but I think it's much more, um, it, it can be much more subjective and a little more ethereal because you're trying to find the truth without saying the truth. Mm. So it's about, uh, do you think it's about honesty? Absolutely. I think it's absolutely about honesty. And in some ways, I think comedy can be a lot more honest than, you know, real hardcore drama. Uh, you know, I'd mentioned again, classical training, and I think, you know, Shakespeare did a wonderful job of illuminating, uh, human truths without saying them, which is why the, you know, these things still exist 500 years after, you know, he stopped writing. Uh, we're still waiting for that next one, Bill, when you get ready, <laughs> just go ahead and put it out. Uh, you know, you've got, you've got a character like Hamlet, who's a fantastic character who's flirting between, you know, madness and sanity and even goes back and says, no, no, I'm sane. And you're like, Really? You're doing some stuff that I think kind of pushes the definition there, Hamlet, buddy. Uh, so, you know, I think, uh, again, when you get into comedy, you, um, you're finding that gap and letting people fill that in. And I think that's, you know, that's one of the things that the best drama does as well. Um, but I think it's a little, you know, it's easier to tap into those emotions of, oh, this is terrible, as opposed to, hey, that's really screwed up, uh, that your comedy tends to, does illuminate. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, when you graduated college and you have your degree in acting, classical theater, mm -hmm. where did you go? What was your next step? Did you want to go pursue a degree or not a degree, but a career on Broadway or where, where were you looking at going? I was, again, coming out of that classical group, I was uh, I didn't have any great insights on being on stage. Uh, part of it was, again, a practicality of, you know, I, would, uh, you know, I was around these actors and uh, you know, performed with a few uh, uh, regional repertory companies and did the, you know, show, the summer Shakespeare circuit. Um, but, you know, getting into Broadway was like, mm, wasn't really crazy about that. I did actually, I moved out to California with the idea, I had relatives in San Francisco, and I came out with the idea of, ah, I'll use that as a base of operations to jump down to LA mm -hmm. and started talking with, you know, several people and, you know, would go down and talk with production companies or do uh, uh, auditions or things like that. I'm like, no, not really crazy about this scene either, <laughs> especially <laughs> as a performer. Uh, and so I kind of walked away from it for a while and I was doing, uh, I would perform here and there, but I was working in video games for a while. I was doing, you know, writing and animation and it's a little bit of megalomania uh, <laughs> in that, you know, you get in when you're in a, a play or do a film, you're, You've got all kinds of actors, and you've got the director, and you've got the script. There's a video game. It's like, oh, I've got, I'm creating my actors, and I'm creating my script. So you know, I have total control. Uh, 
so it was playing in that arena for a while. That's very interesting when you talk about scripts for video games, because that's, I feel like, at least personally, that's something I don't even think about when you're playing a video game yeah. is the characters are speaking, and someone had to write those words at some point in time. So how does a script for a video game go about being written? Is it similar to a movie? It's similar, but you do, it depends on the video game. Uh, if it's something that's a very linear narrative, uh, it's, you, you have that through line of, okay, we're going to take people down this path, and this is what they're going to experience. And they may go over here, so we'll write a little bit of this, and we'll, they may go over here, and we'll write a little bit of that. Uh, so you're still taking people through and finding these little branches of incidental dialogue that you know branch off of that. Um, and it's, it was very difficult for a long time to get any kind of comedy into video games. Uh, you know, there, were certain, there were certain games that would pop up uh, that uh, it was kind of, you know, like they have a tentacle was one very early on and full throttle. Uh, and you know, now you've got, you know, South Park has put out two huge games mm -hmm. because before it, you didn't have a lot of space. You didn't have a lot of bandwidth. So you could basically throw in a joke or a comedic character and you could only enjoy that character once because you didn't have enough computing power or storage power to give that character more than the one line that they had at that point in time. And so it wasn't a very original, uh, you know, you could follow that through line very much like a movie script. Uh, but once you'd experienced it, you had to go in search of the next bit. Uh, that's now, that's changed. Uh, it's still, you know, uh, as few comedies as there are comparatively to dramas that come out in movies or in television, there's even fewer uh, video games that come out that invoke comedy uh, versus, you know, the, the more uh, melodramatic type of video games. Mm-hmm. Why Why do you think that is? Do you think it's because it's just easier to make a video game with a dramatic present than, than, a, than a comedic one? Yeah, I think so. I mean, part of it is the... I think part of it is the, uh, the, the stereotypical grounds that video games play in. Mm -hmm. uh, of, you, you have sci-fi and shoot-em-ups and you know, to a lesser extent the horror-exploring uh, games. Um, so I think you know, that was a little bit of it. I think part of it was also, again, that branching narrative that uh, it was fine. You know, you could take somebody on a, a, a particular narrative, but if they encountered a funny character, they could really only do it once. So uh, and timing, you know, which, again, video games, you don't have a whole lot of control over timing. You put that in control of the player. Mm -hmm. So that's now, it, like I said, it's beginning to change. You're beginning to see more and more stuff that, uh, where before you had video games that were kind of funny in concept. Uh, and you would give people kind of a crazy world to play around in if you could. Um, but it may or may not actually be funny. It was more the idea of it. Now you're getting where you can walk through and there actually are, you know, funny moments and comedy end games. Uh, and I think there's more and more of those coming up. Did you ever get to voice a character in a video game that you helped write for or produce? I, well, I did, but it was, I, it was certainly not comedy. Uh, I was working on a game for, it was a, um, an adaptation of a Japanese anime license with giant robots. Uh, and, you know, I played like one of the characters that, you know, kind of who <laughs> was shouting in your ear, shoot, die, duck. <laughs> uh, I think we actually did a, you know, we did a game show. That was actually probably the closest to comedy just because game shows are kind of on the border of comedy anyway. <laughs> um, just, there's always some slightly absurd, you know, just watching people's reactions. Like, really? You're that enthusiastic about a vowel? Good for you. <laughs> Uh, so I did do a voice at a, a game show, but I, I never really got to do a comedic character. Gotcha. Is that something that, I mean, maybe one day if uh, the opportunity opened up to you, would that be something you're still interested on or do you feel like you've moved oh, on? Oh, absolutely. Oh yeah, for sure. No, I would, if it opened up, I would absolutely love to do it. Like I said, it's one of those in, in terms of comedy to me, uh, the, the video games, because that field has opened up so dramatically. Uh, it used to be, you know, you had to have your Xbox or your PlayStation, so you had to make a, a pretty big investment in just the platform before you could go out and then spend another 50 to $60 on a game, and now you can download them. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, oh, okay, I'm a little bored. It's like 1 o'clock in the morning. I'm a little bored. This looks good. Uh, and finding, you know, how do you insert that into a little, you know, Twitch game? How do you insert some comedy in there? How do you insert some... Uh, uh, you know, I, I would love to, you know, something like Candy Crush. Um, it would be wonderful to have a little comedic voice in there that says, don't you feel silly or something along those lines. Of, mm -hmm. You know, 
it's one o'clock in the morning. It's something that's a little time aware and you're, you're obsessively crushing dots, you mm -hmm. know? <laughs> right. Um, so I think there's certainly some space in there for it. Mm -hmm. And I wonder too, uh, the rise of virtual reality where people are themselves getting into the game. If we'll see a rise of uh, comedy related games, cause you could definitely have a game where you are a stand up comedian or you are a performer in the VR world. So that could be oh, in yeah. the future coming very soon. Yeah, I mean, there there have been, uh, I think they're still around. There were certainly, for a long time, there were uh, destination camps where people could go you know, be fantasy rock stars or fantasy comedians, mm -hmm. uh, which were very popular. Uh, if you could then download that to your desktop and do it in the privacy of your home, it's a great, okay, you know what? You do this as your virtual reality and you practice your routine and you get feedback on it. Uh, you know, I certainly, I think there are a lot of people that would love to give that a try. Uh, you know, I think there's a lot of, there's also the, um, uh, I think it's called enhanced reality. All of a sudden I'm, I'm spacing on the exact term, but it's the, you know, like the Pokemon go where you're walking around the real world, and, you know, looking through your phone, which, you know, is slightly absurd in and of itself. Uh, <laughs> but you're finding these characters in the world and it would be wonderful to have, uh, you know, I heard somebody was doing a virtual or an enhanced reality, uh, tour. Uh, of different cities so you don't need a tour guide you can walk around you point your phone at this building and it says this building was erected by josiah stone in 1728 and all the and it would be wonderful to have uh, you know those little things pop in uh, mm -hmm. of those comedy things of you know and by the way he was completely addicted to cocaine before he knew what it was you know? <laughs> right uh, or you point at the same building the second time and you get something why are you looking at this you've seen this let's go someplace else right uh to be able to point those things out. So I think that's a big opportunity as well. Right. I'm sure, I'm sure as the future goes on, comedy will become even more closely intertwined with virtual reality, augmented reality, all the different types of things. Cause for the reason like what you're saying, I, I completely, completely agree. So let me ask you, uh, cause I know today you're very involved with improv. So when did you get mm -hmm. involved with improv? How did that happen? Uh, I've been involved in improv for just over 15 years now. And it happened, you know, like I said, I had gotten away from the, the performing for a while uh, and was just inundated and, and working in all kinds of crazy, strange hours. And I finally went, you know, I need something to get me out of sitting at a desk trying to be funny and, and you know, trying to write this stuff. And I had heard about, you know, I'd seen uh, Whose Line Is It Anyway, for example. Mm -hmm. And again, I thought, you know, these people are just genetic mutants. Nobody can just make this stuff up. Uh, so I had my doubts when I heard about improv training, whether anybody could learn this, but I thought, well, oh, this will be fun. This will be a nice little get me out of the office thing. And, uh, I was just, I was fascinated with the process. I was immediately, it was everything I loved about theater and none of the stuff I hated. Um, because you came in and there wasn't a director. You got, you know, any number of people up on stage and everybody was a director. Uh, you didn't have, you know, somebody wasn't cast because they were the director's cousin. Uh, you came in and you, you know, you had no idea what role you were going to play that yeah, night. Right. So it was, you know, really immediate and I got hooked on it, uh, very quickly. Uh, and I will say with, uh, bats, the group I'm with in San Francisco, they had this real wonderful emphasis on story. And I think there's a lot of improv that's out there. That's the emphasis is on, uh, be funny fast and, uh, bats came in and they do, a, we do a lot of what we call single narrative improv. So we'll do a, uh, improvised Shakespeare. You know, that's uh, two halves with an intermission. Uh, and some of these are just outrageously funny mm -hmm. of where they show up. But it comes out of us actually trying to, you know, as hard as we can, tell a good Shakespeare story. And when you have six to eight people who are trying to write a Shakespeare story at the same time they're acting it, mistakes are going to come out. Uh, you're, you're going to have those little weird, absurdist things that pop out because okay, this is this person, that's what that person saw, nobody else saw it, now let's justify that, let's make that right, you know, that one principle of improv, yes and, mm -hmm. uh, let's make that right and let's move forward with that. Um, so I remember, uh, you know, for example, I uh, did a Shakespeare show a little bit ago where one person was wandering through the forest and it hadn't been made very clear, uh, it was very clear in this person's mind, the other person thought they were wandering through a greenhouse and <laughs> walked out of a door uh, and so the person walking through the forest, you know, did you just walk out of a door from that tree? Yes, I live in this tree, you know, so we had this <laughs> character that just had a, you know, was popping out of doors and random trees of the forest. Mm -hmm. 
I like that though because I like how I mean they work together and it, like one person had one idea, the other person had another idea, and they came together to make an idea that was so absurd and so silly, and that's what makes I think improv so much fun and that demonstrates. Oh that. yeah, yeah, and especially when you double down on it and make those things absolutely right. Um, uh, you know, I just did a actually literally two days ago did a show. Uh, we were doing an improvised farce, kind of like a, a you know noises off again, much more of a stage play or you know some of the better sitcoms uh, where you you know you have this situation that starts very normally and spins out of control because you have big characters and uh, you might have some you know people are plotting to do you know something to get their particular goal. They're planning to you know, steal the jewels from a hotel safe or something like that, and the, and the plans get more and more absurd. Mm-hmm. And there was one uh, particular character who. Uh, had come to this hotel and was very wealthy and was kind of very blustery and demanded to you know, see his friend who was the owner of the hotel. And this character that had come in accidentally drank uh, this. It was set in, an, in a jungle. It was this jungle resort, jungle getaway, and accidentally drank this po- uh, potion that made him uh, a little susceptible and completely you know, dropped all his things. So I came in as the owner of the hotel, who had been his lifelong fe- uh, friend, and he starts spouting things that are, you know, he's remembering or making up or hallucinating. And he just looks at me and says, you're dressed as a mermaid. Yeah. And I pulled him aside. And said, We'd ne- we agreed we'd never talk about that Mike in college. <laughs> and so it became, you know, whatever he said, no matter how weird, it was actually a fact. Right. So how long were you an improv student until you became comfortable with being able to teach others what you had learned? I, I was going to say, I was actually, I was performing for a while. And I think, uh, you know, it's kind of interesting. Improv is one of those things because you just show up. There are some people that study for about a year and immediately go out and start teaching. Uh, for me, I had been performing uh, for, boy, probably a good six or seven years before I thought, okay, I feel really confident that when somebody comes in and has a question and doesn't quite know, you know, how do I go with this? Is there certain rules in, in improv Actually, I should say principles, because for every rule, the rule can be broken. Uh, like that rule of yes ands, for mm-hmm. example. Uh, fantastic rule, you know, agree, add something, move stuff forward. But there are times when you, know, you don't want to yes and everything, because then it just goes all over the place. Right. So for me, it was a good, I would say, six or seven years before I felt like, okay, yeah, I really can come in and, and teach people effectively so they can get to where they need to go, as opposed to me just you know, spouting doctrine. Wow. And what is, in your opinion, what is the number one principle of improv? Like, what, how do you live your improv life? Uh, my improv life, I would say the number one principle is listen. Uh, and when they're on stage, it's so much more, the, the good stuff is so much more about reacting than creating. And it's, you're never quite sure. It's like, okay, who's following, who's leading? I'm not sure. Uh, but if you're really watching your partners and you're really paying attention to what's happening, there's always something that's going to pop up um, that is a little out of the norm. That's a little, you know, as a human beings, if it happened in the real world, we go, hang on. Uh, and it, so it's leaning into your partners and really paying attention to everything that's going on, uh, as opposed to getting up in your head and thinking, oh, this would be funny. Um, mm-hmm. And if you, you know, are listening to that and reacting with honest reactions, it's amazing the stuff that comes out of it. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, for sure. And so tell me, because you mentioned bats uh, a little earlier, and I know that's where you mm-hmm. currently are. So for those people who are listening that don't know what bats is, can you tell me a little bit like uh, like the history of it and just what it is in San Francisco? Yeah, absolutely. Bats has been around for, we're now going into our 32nd year of operation, uh, which is, I, I had realized, I just listened to uh, Mike Reese's book about uh, The Simpsons, Simpsons Confidential. And he was talking about, we just ended our 30th season. I went, wow, we've had this place that's been around for two years longer than The Simpsons. I yeah. didn't think anything existed longer than The Simpsons. <laughs> uh, but they started in 1986, long before I came on the scene. And uh, it was a group, there were various improvisers scattered about. And they joined together uh, to try these different formats. And one in particular was the single narrative long form. Because uh, there was a lot of, there's a lot of long form in the form of like the Herald or you know, Chicago long form that's out there where you, you get something and you do various scenes spinning off a particular suggestion. Mm-hmm. They were like, hey, could we really come together and tell a story or do a play without any preparation? 
And so they have really pioneered that. The I think one of the things that's fascinating about bats, it's really uh, an amazing group to play with, is that about half of the troop, and we have uh, about 20 resident actors uh, in the company, uh, about half of them are founding members. So they've been playing together for over 30 years. They have this vast experience. And, uh, you know, that you really don't have that anyplace else. Uh, we have people that have been constantly playing together for three decades. So uh, we, do, we do shows still every Friday and Saturday night. Uh, we you know, probably do, boy, uh, around 30 different formats a year. Wow. Uh, ranging from, you know, full-length plays, uh, you know, Shakespeare and uh, completely improvised musicals, uh, to we've got uh, a format coming up uh, that is, <laughs> uh, oddly enough, here's some comedy goal for you, inspired by Bertolt Brecht, uh, <laughs> who was a German playwright who was very political and, and loved this idea of alienation as opposed to feeling with the story that from time to time you could back people out and go, oh, hang on, let me think about this. Uh, and that really came to us because we have people from all over the world that come to train with us and there's a fantastic theater in Berlin uh, called, I, I'm going to butcher the name, uh, Theater on the Probe, I believe. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure I apologize to anybody German for butchering your language <laughs> after that. Uh, but we come in and get some topic that the audience votes on and suggests. Uh, and generally, it is a sociopolitical topic, uh, ranging from healthcare to, you know, last year we had one about uh, white privilege. You know, again, comedy gold, right? <laughs> right. Uh, but being able to then spend stories around that and and, and tell stories within that and explore those issues, uh, you know, it's it, it's a very brave and scary thing to do, and yet you know, it generally works out really, really wonderfully. So, and as as artistic director of the theater, is that your call on what formats to produce, and or who's choosing that? That's me. I mean, I generally, because we're an artist-led company, uh, it's, I generally go and say, you know, who's excited by this? Or, uh, you know, for example, we, we did a format called Women of the West in May. Uh, there was, there's a, a great show on Netflix called Godless. And one of our players said, hey, I'd really love to do this. We're doing Westerns that really feature women's stories in the West. And, you know, said, great. Ran it past the, generally we'll run it past the company and say, what do you guys think? Um, because you know, as an artistic director, I will also say that I'm, I'm not arrogant enough to go, my ideas are the best. Everybody <laughs> do this. So I generally do go and say, Hey, how do you feel about this? Does this really excite you? But I have a good idea of what excites our artists, uh, what challenges them. Uh, and you know, so the final determination does come down to me, but it really is a group conversation. Mm -hmm. And as artistic director, do you go see other improv shows and sketch shows to try to get different ideas for new formats and new things that you can present to your audiences? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I take a look at, you know, we've got a number of groups in San Francisco. It's really exploded in the past, I don't know, probably five or six years. Uh, but I also go and see traditional theater. Ah. And see scripted things and say, oh, I would love to do that. Uh, a couple of years ago, I directed a, uh, in February, and directed a romantic comedy musical, uh, and which was completely inspired by me seeing La La Land in December. Mm. And part of it was, wow, that's a really fun movie. And, you know, there's also, anytime I see a movie, I get out of the theater and I go, okay, how can we do that on stage? Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes the answer is, you know, if I see the latest Marvel superhero film, the answer is, nope, can't do that. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> surprisingly enough, there's always, we find a way to tell those stories. Mm -hmm. That's funny that you bring up La La Land because, uh, and I don't remember which guest I had. It was, it was months ago. Um, but I, I asked a, a similar question about like going to other theaters and looking at things for inspiration. And she told me a story uh, that she had a friend who, and you might have heard of this because I know the friend was out of LA. So you might have heard of this uh -huh. show um, where the guy, it was a guy, and he wrote Emma Stone's one woman show, what he thought it would be. And he performed the entire thing in drag. And it, it, oh, wow. it was met with such accolades that he was actually moved to off Broadway where he got to do it for a little <laughs> bit. <laughs> so it was like, and, but it, it was a very similar thing of how, and that's what you were talking about. It made me think of that because, you know, you go and see and get inspired and you think, okay, how can I translate this to the stage? 
So that's super yeah. cool that that's what you're doing. And like what you said, yeah, not everything be translated, but in a lot of ways, you know, a lot of things can be translated that you wouldn't think. Yeah. Uh, and again, I will say that's one of the great things about that is that we've had a number of years of where we've tried to do you know, this particular thing and, you know, it works or it fails. And generally when it fails, we come back and go, OK, how could we do it better? Um, we did, uh, if, for example, one of the things we did this past year, we, we did another, I think it was probably our second, maybe third run of Twilight Zone. Mm. Uh, and we're setting it in the, doing it as if it was an extension of the 1950s show. And you're like, okay, wait a minute. How do you improvise something with a twist ending? <laughs> right. You know, when you have no, you have no idea what the script is. And we would do four episodes a night. So effectively, you know, four little mini TV episodes. And we played with doing it a little bit longer. And we went, no, that's, there's a reason why those were, you know, fit in a half hour format. <laughs> yeah. uh-huh. uh, you know, they really don't want to extend past that. Uh, and the coming up with those twist endings and coming up with our, you know, the special effects. Uh, how we do that on stage with, uh, you know, with our bodies or voices or a microphone when you basically have nothing, you know, except a few chairs, really. Uh, mm-hmm. It was really remarkable how well a lot of that stuff worked. Mm-hmm. Um, we did, uh, we've done, you know, improvised James Bond. I you know, have had the number of like chase and fight scenes I've had on tops of trains in improv shows is really kind of remarkable. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it really is, it's surprising how much stuff we actually can put on stage. Mm-hmm. And for you personally, as a personal improviser, what do you incorporate from your classical theater training and things you learned about acting in, in college and your university? What do you incorporate into your improv scenes? Uh, there's a lot of, there's some very basic stuff of you have to be heard, you have to be seen. So knowing, you know, making sure that your deaf aunt who's sitting, you know, 20 rows back can actually hear you. Mm-hmm. And I will say that's another thing actually that's wonderful about bats. We have this uh, wonderful 200 seat theater uh, as opposed to you know a black box where a lot of improv is performed. Mm-hmm. So we can, this when you walk in, your expectations are a little different just based off the space. Mm-hmm. Uh, but making sure you can be heard, uh, because there's a lot of, if you're committing vocally to whatever's going on, it does clarify you a little bit. It gets you a little more, okay, I'm really buying into the acting of whatever the absurdity you know that just happened out of this particular situation. Mm-hmm. Uh, and being seen, stage picture. Uh, of, oh, okay, I'm upstaging somebody, or I'm behind somebody, or I'm in front of somebody, and just having that awareness. Just that, you know, technical part of the craft. Uh, the other part, and I, actually, I used to joke as a, a, a good friend, and, and one of, who was one of my teachers, and is, a, you know, now a mentor and a good friend, uh, I used to joke with them that it took me two years to figure out that improv involved acting. <laughs> uh, and uh, there is a lot of, to me, it's like committing to whatever that situation is. There's, there's an irony in improv that the, the more you try to commit to the reality of the situation that's being presented on stage, as opposed to worrying about being funny, right. uh, but the more you commit to that, you're doing a film noir, you want to play a goody detective and really try that. And that's when those mistakes pop up is the harder you try, the more the gap opens up and those, you know, absurd surprise elements pop in. Mm-hmm. Um, I refer to it as the uncanny valley of comedy. <laughs> that it's, you know, you actually... The, you know, the closer you get to the real thing, the more the absurdities become apparent. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. When I started doing improv, I always felt that like you, I I had to have a character. Like I always have to have a character. And yeah. then I was interviewing uh, some uh, improviser named Cassidy Russell, who now is in Chicago, and yeah. she. Mm-hmm told me this one piece of advice that I'll, I'll never forget, and it's very similar to like what you were saying, and she just said, she said, nothing is more fun than crying in an improv scene. And I was like, oh, yeah. I was like, what? what? What does that mean? And then she like, <laughs> she went on to like explain to me that it's all about the realness of it and just like committing and then bringing real emotion into the scene and that bringing, being real. And I mean, this goes back to the, our very beginning of the conversation where we talked about honesty and comedy, being honest mm-hmm. in an improv scene. That's, that makes a huge difference from good and bad improv. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, there's, uh, I saw a troupe uh, many years ago that had a good reputation. And I, I, you know, I won't mention their name because I was really surprised and, and I, you know, disappointed. I hate to say that. You know, I want to support my fellow improvisers, and yet this particular group was, you, know, you could tell they were skating on the surface. Mm-hmm. And anytime there was a mistake, as opposed to, you know, one person said one thing and somebody else was expecting something else, as opposed to 
justifying that and making it right, making your partner look good. And you know, again, all of those principles of improv, uh, they would kind of laugh and say, oh, I'm on meth. Uh, and what? You know, even in the audience, it, uh, yeah, they would just kind of blow it away. Oh, I'm on meth. And I, you know, at one point in the time, I wanted to just stand up and go, meth addiction is a serious problem. And introduce some seriousness into this. And, you know, I mm-hmm. fortunately, I withheld myself. I managed to yeah. <laughs> some momentary self containment. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, we love, uh, you know, I had a conversation a couple of weeks ago with another bass player. And so we love when we get those, those other noises. Yeah, we love, you know, we love laughter. We love those big laughs. We love making the audiences happy. Mm-hmm. But the number of times I've played uh, bad you know, antagonist, whether that's in Shakespeare or film noir, you know, whatever. And you want that character to die. You know, your job is to make yourself as bad as possible. And when that character dies, you hear cheers from the audience, you know, and I'm kind of laying there dead on the ground and hopefully I'm facing upstage. They don't see me smiling, that I'm really enjoying the fact that, you know, they're cheering that the bad guy is yeah, dead. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. We, uh, few, uh, a show we did about a month ago at one point, it was set in the 1920s. Uh, the, the hotel laundry room of uh, a Chicago hotel in the 1920s. And this one character came in as an anarchist. <laughs> and, you know, he had a couple of sticks of dynamite. And I'm going to blow this up and, you know, get rid of capitalism as we know it. And uh, from the audience, we heard this very faint, yay! You know, yeah. and so we were thrilled that there was one person who got really excited about the idea yeah. of the overthrowing capitalism in the 1920s. So. Right. So in your, in your personal opinion, um, how do you save a dying improv scene? I think the biggest thing is, uh, you know, the interesting thing is I would say part of it is commit at the beginning uh, and really set your, you know, what is this scene about and really take your time getting that going. Because most of the, the really awful crashes and improv scenes that I've had have been because you didn't take your time at the beginning. You were rushing too fast to, try and make something interesting happen. Mm-hmm. Um, but when they're really going down, uh, I think the what you have to do is, again, that commit, you know, it's double down on it, react to you. Somebody says something, have an emotional reaction, have that affect you. Uh, and whether that will save the scene or not is kind of up in the air. It has a better chance than, you know, kind of pulling back and, you know, going up in your head and floating above the scene and saying, oh, as a director or writer, how would I fix this? Uh, but if you commit to that, people are going to be a little more with you. Mm-hmm. And if it still goes down in flames, at least you have a fantastic, it's like, okay, you know what? This plane's going to crash. Let's just nose it in and make a spectacular <laughs> explosion. Yep. Uh, and it's amazing how much audiences really enjoy people having a good time. Uh, you know, if they're failing, uh, that they're really enjoying failing, I'm having a great time doing it. <laughs> Absolutely. So Ken, where do you see uh, bats headed? What, what does the future hold for the theater? For, you know, for bats, we're always very interested in uh, pushing that, that edge, you know, between, uh, blurring that edge between improv and theater. And improv and film in a lot of ways, but improv and theater especially. Uh, and actually, it's our, our tagline is real funny theater. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I find every one of those words is like just three words, but every one of them is very important. So finding those, you know, what's that next step? What's the thing that challenges us as improvisers? Uh, what's the thing that challenges us to put more truth on stage? Uh, because the, the irony is that we know funny will come along for the ride. Mm-hmm. Uh, that it's, you know, it's kind of a trust fall in some ways of, okay, lean into this and we know funny's going to come along for the ride. So uh, I, I just mentioned this show the, this past weekend, this farce. Uh, we did something brand new with this. Uh, it was directed by uh, one, of our, one of the founding members of BATS, Regina Saisi. We had this idea of, okay, let's get a door. Let's put just a standalone door in the center of the stage. And what happens is that you know, on one side of that door is the lobby of the hotel. And then on the other side, somebody walks through that door, and then when they come back in, it's the kitchen, and all of the characters change. So now everybody's playing at least two characters, and sometimes two and three and four. Wow. So, you know, we go from a cast of six to a cast of 12 to a cast of 18 to a cast of 24, uh, basically with a door shut. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it was very theatrical and very uh, interesting, you know, challenging to the improvisers. And sometimes we got it wrong, and you know, but uh, we got it right a lot more often than we got it wrong. It was a really interesting challenge of what's that next thing, mm-hmm. uh, and you know, how do we how do we tell this story? How do we seamlessly change locations when basically we have one set piece? Mm-hmm. Wow, I like that idea. That's so clever, so creative. 
Yeah, no, I was going to say, the uh, you know, Regina came to me with the idea. Uh, she's been the, the dean of our school. Oh. Uh, so, and you know, again, I, there's so many people in that company. I go friend and mentor. It's kind of, that's everybody friend and mentor. And you know, Regina said, I have this idea. She explained it to me. And I think my eyes you know, lit up like a five-year-old on like Christmas morning. I'm like, yes, you know? <laughs> uh, and <laughs> so just those little things that, you know, how do we, how do we do that? How do we split that? Right. Um, it, there are so many things that, uh, that to be explored in the theatrical realm that I think you know, a lot of improv is concerned with, okay, how do we, you know, how do we make it faster and funnier? And again, we're going, how do we do, we know that's going to come along for the ride. The more we push the theatrical aspect. Mm -hmm. And Ken, what does the future hold for you? Do you have any projects you're working on? Anything you're uh, up on your calendar? Uh, well, to say the, you know, being an artistic director and performer and trainer, uh, certainly fills up the calendar quite a bit. Yeah. Um, I always, you know, I, I do have this other side that, uh, which is the writing and, you know, playing with that. And, and like I said, that's still, that kind of goes back to what I was talking about with video games. There's a little bit of my megalomania. Of, you know, I can control everyone. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I only recently did I start getting fascinated, uh, with, uh, this type of work in, uh, in novels of, of comedy. You've got people like Douglas Adams and Terry Pratchett, uh, and more currently a, uh, there's a, fantastic author by the name of Christopher Moore uh, of you know, where they're bringing comedy into novels. And I, you know, I always laugh because it's, you, you reducing on stage, you've got, you've got the visual and you've got the sound and you've got the words. Mm -hmm. And now I'm removing as much as possible and, you know, okay, well, how do you do that with just the words? Uh, so I, it's certainly not anything that I've committed to at this point in time, but I'm really fascinated with it. And there again, it's, you know, like you get started, it's the, you, you look at the amount of drama uh, that is in, uh, movies and in theater and in video games and you know all these other medium uh, and comedy is a very small percentage. It's an even tinier percentage in in novels. Mm -hmm. So I'm 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 curious about that. I'm curious about how do you add that into that particular form. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And for my last question for you, it's is a question I ask every single guest on the show. Um, so you are actually the 45th episode of talking late night so this will be the 45th time this question has been answered yeah. so I was saying, considering considering who our 45th president is right now i, I you know can we just skip 45 <laughs> okay then we'll uh, only this is with <laughs> <laughs> we'll say 4x we won't say we won't put a 4x. five there 4x with an asterisk. <laughs> there we go Great. so the question for you is uh if someone eventually wants to be in your shoes what piece of advice would you give them I would say there are so many more resources now around, uh, both for writing and improv, than there were when I started looking at these things. Like I said, when I you know, was first vaguely aware that there were people out there doing improv and, and uh, comedic writing and sketch and all this, I thought it was something that you know, the angels had to sing and the heavens had to open up and you, know, you had to be you know, plucked off the face of the earth to do that. And now that's not the case. There are, you know, improv classes in pretty much every city around. Uh, very, very few places have I run into where there's not at least one improv group training. And there's a number, you know, there are great books on it. There, are, uh, there's a few, uh, you know, videos of, oh, okay, that's how they do it here. And I will say I've, I've trained with a number of different groups because I tend to be philosophy agnostic. It's like I'm, I'm more interested in what works than a particular set of principles. Um, but even more so in the comedy writing uh, group, there are, you know, there's a number of online classes out of groups like, you know, Second City in Chicago, which is fantastic writing classes. Um, and so getting into those and, uh, you know, it's one of those, uh, I'm sure you have had this question too. It's like, do you really think uh, comedy can be taught? I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, I'm not entirely sure, but I do know it's a great place to practice and get feedback. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's really where those things shine. So it's, you know, find an improv group for a class, uh, find a, find a stand-up class, you know, go check that out. See, see what fits, see what resonates for you. Uh, try with those online classes where you're finding those new principles and exploring new forms. Uh, because those resources right now are really very readily available, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And Ken, if people want to find out more about you or find out more about Bats Improv, um, what are ways that they can do that? Uh, the best way would be to go to improv.org. Uh, that's the Bats website. You can tell how early we formed that group since we got that particular role. I was thinking uh, that, so, yep. 
<laughs> you're like, really? How did that happen? I, I was uh, when I yeah. went when I went to the website when I was uh, looking you up. I was like, improv.org. How early did, did they get this <laughs> URL? <laughs> so you guys yeah, are lucky. Now you'd have to do you know tangerine atomic dog improv dot us. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Oh yeah, you. I, I'm sure a lot of theaters would would love that URL. So you are a big winner there. Oh yeah. We we had a uh, when I came in as the artistic director about a month later. We had a bit of a crisis because nobody had told us the improv was up or the uh, domain of improv.org was up for renewal. So you know we were like don't let that slip, not even an hour. <laughs> so, yeah, we start hanging on to that for a while. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And how can people uh, find it? Don't you have a website? Yes, I do. It's uh, kentankerous dot com, k e n t a n k e r o u s dot com, uh, and uh, you can also find me on Twitter at condition, um, uh, which because cantankerous was gone, that was uh, was gone. Oh. So there we go. There's that domain thing, and I've gotten on that one. Improv dot org is for <laughs> yeah. thirty years before Twitter was founded. I think, so, uh, but yeah, you can find me. Uh, both uh, the Twitter account uh, is linked to the website, so that might be the best place to go. Yeah, sounds awesome. I feel like someone out there just as a personal vendetta for not getting improv.org, they were like, we're going to take <laughs> Ken Robertson's potential Twitter name. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, that may be what it is. I may have to have somebody, you know, the next time I'm leaving the theater, I'm going to have other people start my car for me. Right, you got <laughs> you got to hire a bodyguard at this point, all because exactly. of improv.org. Yeah, pr protect the guy who protects the domain. Yeah. <laughs> well, Ken, thank you again so much for being on the show. I really enjoyed talking with you. My pleasure. Thank you, Matt. It's been great. And to anybody listening, remember, you can visit us at our website at www.talkinglatenight.com. You can also find us at our Facebook page at Talking Late Night. And you can also find us on iTunes where you can rate and leave us a review. So thanks again to Ken for being on the show. Thanks to you for listening. And we'll see you next time. <laughs>